this is going to be John chapter 6, and I'm going to talk about the subject of, I have decided to follow Jesus. Why should you decide to follow Jesus? In John 6, 1 and 2, it says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So great multitudes followed him. And the greatest decision that you ever made was to follow Jesus. And there are a lot of safe people who aren't following Jesus. They believe the gospel, but never became a disciple. And I'm going to give you some reasons why I decided to follow Jesus. In verse 2 there, it said, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So, number one, why follow Jesus? Because... He's a miracle worker. What Jesus did for me when I got saved is a miracle. I don't believe every Christian will show a changed life outwardly. But when I got saved, something changed in me inwardly. I didn't give up every pet sin overnight. And there was some things that happened instantly for me. And I said for me, that might not be your situation or what happened to you when you got saved. But I never had a desire to read the Bible. I never had a desire to listen to hymns. I never had a desire to quit cussing. But something changed the night I got saved on the inside. It was a miracle that I didn't stay in the shape that I was in. The people followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. If you're lost, then you have a disease. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.9, For we have all proved before both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So we've all sinned. 1 John 1.8-10 through 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We all had a sin disease. If you're lost, you still have it. And if you're saved, your flesh still has it. But Jesus is the only cure for this sin disease. Now verse 3 says, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, I decided to follow Jesus because of his miracles. And next, I decided to follow Jesus because he loved me first. Notice that in these verses here, Jesus wasn't thinking about himself. He said, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? He saw a great company come unto him, and he was thinking about how to get them some food, not about himself. First John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. He became sin for me. He took the wrath of God for me. He lived a sinless life for me. He was buried and resurrected for me. So... I follow him because he loved me first. We love him because he first loved us. John 6, 5, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And you see, Jesus is always asking questions that he already knows the answer to because he's omniscient. It's like you do with your kids. You ask them questions all the time that you already know the answer to. You're just trying to teach them something. And that's what he does with the disciples many times. He asks them questions he already knows because he's trying to teach them a thing or two. John 6, 6 and 7 says, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. It would take a lot more than two hundred penny worth of bread to buy bread for all those people. To, or to feed all those people. Matthew 20 and verse 2 says, A man works for a penny a day. It would take a lot of work to buy this many people bread. John 6, 8 and 9 says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here 
which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So next, I, f I followed Jesus because of his miracles and because he loved me first, and also because he can make something out of nothing, which that's me, I'm nothing, and that's you, you're nothing. He's going to take these five barley loaves and two small fishes and make something from basically nothing. John 6, 10 through 12 says, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. So Jesus took the lad's lunch and fed 5,000 men, including women and children. Imagine your lunch that you take to work, somebody taking that little lunch, like today I had chicken salad sandwich. Imagine Jesus taking that and feeding 5,000 people with it. Jesus can make something out of basically nothing, which he can do with you if you let him, because you're nothing. Uh, Proverbs fifteen sixteen says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. I know I'm little. I'm nothing without Jesus Christ. But little is much with Jesus Christ. He can make something out of nothing. Better is little with the fear of the Lord. And that's what the Lord did back in Genesis 1, 1. John 1 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In the beginning, God made something out of nothing. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he can make something out of nothing. If he can make the universe out of nothing, then he can make enough bread and fish for 5,000 people, including women and children, and he can make something out of you which is a nobody a sinner john six ten, and jesus said make the men sit down now there was much grass in the place so the men sat down in number about five thousand jesus is the one that made the grass for them to sit on in john one eleven, it said and god said let the earth bring forth grass so you wouldn't have even have a place to sit down on the ground if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Notice it says for the men to sit down in number about 5,000. What about the women and children? So there's no telling how many people was there. It was 5,000 men, but what about the women and children? John six eleven says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. If Jesus wanted to, he could have had made the food appear in the people's lap. Instead, he has the disciples give it out. He wants to make something out of the disciples. And you let him make something out of you when you go to work for him. Just like he gave the disciples food to give out, is just like how he gives men the word of God, and he wants them to give it out to the people. He wants you to feed the people. He wants you to take part in showing the power of God. And he gave gift to the body of Christ. He gave evangelists, pastors, teachers to teach his words to the people, to edify the body of Christ. And it's every Christian's responsibility to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Psalms 126.6 He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. 1 Peter 5.2 says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, 
not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Acts twenty twenty eight. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So he wants to make something out of us. He wants us to feed others. Notice in John six eleven, the Lord distributes to the disciples first, then they give it out. God has to give you something from his word. It can happen in many ways. Many times you just read it and a certain phrase or word just gets a hold of you. But he wants that to burn in you. He gives you something. It burns in you and then you give it to somebody else. John six twelve says, When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. The Lord doesn't lose anything worth keeping. Just like he preserves preserved the bread, he preserved the bread of the word of God. Psalms 12, 6 through 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The word of God is preserved. He hadn't lost none of it. Second Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The scripture corrects me, the nobody, the sinner, the big zero, the nothing. Yeah, I don't correct it. Why would a big zero like me be able to take the King James Bible and say this word should really be this? You must think highly of yourself if you can take the Bible and say that the words are wrong in the Bible. And I don't care who it is, whoever changes the Bible is a fool. He's a liar. Second uh, Peter one twenty one says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You can't correct on the King James, it corrects you. God preserved his word. John six thirteen and 14 says, Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So why have I decided to follow Jesus? The next reason is because he's my favorite preacher. Matthew 12:42 says the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and Jesus said behold a greater than Solomon is here Luke 11:32 says the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold Jesus said a greater than Jonas is here Solomon calls himself the preacher. The Lord gave him wisdom above all men. Jonah was a preacher that graduated from well. And Jesus says he's greater than Solomon and that he's greater than Jonah. And then the people said in John chapter 6 that this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And Acts 3.22 says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet Shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me? Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Acts 7.37 says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. He's better than Solomon. He's greater than Jonah. He's greater than Moses. And I have a lot of favorite preachers, but Jesus is the preacher of preachers. He's what every preacher preaches about. I love preachers. I love my pastor, Donnie Dalton. I love Danny Castle, Bevins Welder, David Hoffman, men like Peter Ruckman, Jeff Owens, James Knox, Larry Winkler, Mays Jackson, Harold Seitler, David Walker. There are many good preachers, but all the ones I like are all directing you towards Jesus Christ, the preacher of preachers. Jesus is the preacher of all preachers that are really preaching right, that really have the right Bible. 
Matthew 7, 28 and 29 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He preaches with authority. He preaches a negative message. He's the one who said in Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He was a hellfire preacher, but he was also a loving and kind preacher. A lot more loving and kind and gracious and merciful than you are because you wouldn't have died for a bunch of wicked people like us. John 6.15 says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Acts 4.13 talks about when the people saw the boldness of Peter and John, they could tell that they had been with Jesus. And that shows me that Jesus was bold. Proverbs 28, 1 says, The righteous are bold as a lion. Jesus isn't only the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is also the lion of the tribe of Judah, as it calls him in Revelation 5, 5. And it says there in verse 15, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. That's why he. another reason why he's such a good preacher. He was prayed up all the time. He stayed prayed up. But the next reason I follow Jesus is because he is, he is a king. These people were trying to make him a king before, their time, before he wanted to be one. Many people would go to hear the president speak if he came to their town. And you know it would be packed. And the president is just a finite sinner who needs a savior like me and you. But, but Jesus is a sinless king and he will reign as a righteous dictator. He didn't want to be made king yet because he knew he had to get a crown of thorns before he gets a crown of gold. But that's the thing. People, uh, people, th those people thought that the Son of God would come and set up his kingdom and get a crown. They didn't understand about the cross and the crown of thorns. They were looking for a kingdom. They weren't looking forward to the cross. They were looking forward to a kingdom. Jesus knew he was going to be made king, so he had no trouble with the temptation of turning down becoming a king too early. John 18.36 says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. The devil tried to, to get to give him the kingdom in Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus just lets him know that he's not for sale. He didn't need to be made king then because he's going to come become king when he's supposed to become king. But Jesus is my king. And one of these days we're going to hear an angel proclaim it. In Revelation eleven fifteen. it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But why else should you follow him? Because he's in control. He controls the storm and the sea. In John six sixteen through 19, it says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. So Jesus just said, Go on, boys, I'll catch up with you later. And they're probably like, How are you going to do that? Then later on, here he comes walking on the water, in the windy water, just like he's walking in freshly cut grass on a nice summer's day. Psalms 89 9 says, Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. He's in control. He's in complete control. Those people that have the H A R R P or whatever it is think they control the weather. But the Lord really controls the weather. He just lets them think they control it. John 6 20 and 21 says, But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land where they went. Notice they willingly received him. Willingly. They willingly 
received him into the ship. The disciples weren't Calvinists. They willingly received him, and they they knew they could willingly receive him. He didn't make them receive him into the ship. He could have just walked right on without the ship and got there quicker than they would have, but they let him in. Jesus wants you to let him in. John six twenty one. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land, whither they went. Notice as soon as he got on the ship, it immediately teleported to where they were going. And that's what happens when I got saved. When I willingly received Jesus Christ, when I willingly received him, when I received Jesus Christ, I was immediately transported to where I wanted to go. And you receive him. You don't just believe he existed in history. You receive him. 1 Corinthians 15.1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which ye also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. But when I received him, I was immediately transported to where I was going. Ephesians 2, 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just like when the disciples willingly received him into the ship, they were teleported to where it was they were going to begin with. When I willingly received him, I was immediately made to sit together in heavenly places with him. I'm in Christ, I'm part of his body, and in that sense, I'm already sitting in heavenly places with him. That happened immediately after I believed the gospel. Just like I got the Holy Spirit the moment I believed the gospel. It says in Ephesians, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There's a lot of things you get immediately at salvation. And if you're not saved, I've already given you the gospel. And that's Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And all you have to do to be saved is come to him as the no good guilty sinner that you are. And put your trust on him and what he did for you on the cross to pay for your sin debt. Only then can you be saved and have eternal life.